perfect so what we have uh, let's continue with our webinar so this is the fourth day of the training right so the very first thing today we are going to discuss about is implementing ethernet virtual lans so we are going to talk about the vlans right now when i am talking about vlans what so before understanding vlan you must have a specific understanding of the definition of lan local area network from one perspective a lan it includes all the users devices servers uh, switches routers cables wireless access points in one location right and there is an alternate and narrower definition for that of a lan that if there are multiple devices in the network so i'm sending data to all the devices that are there in the network right that is the meaning of broadcast a broadcast domain it includes the set of all lan connected devices so that when any of the devices need a uh, sends a broadcast frame so all the other devices they get a copy of the frame right so from one perspective you can think of a lan and a broadcast domain as basically the same thing right now using only default settings what a switch does it considers all its interfaces to be in the same broadcast domain that is for one switch right when a broadcast frame entered one switch port the switch forwards that broadcast frame out of all the other ports right and with that logic to create two different broadcast domains you have to buy two different ethernet lan switches perfect now by using two vlans what we can do we can like a single switch can accomplish the same goal of the design right so with vlans a switch can configure some interfaces into broad into one broadcast domain and some into another creating multiple broadcast domain and these individual broadcast domains created by the switch are called vlans which stands for virtual local area network yes perfect now <clears throat> when we are talking about vlans right so creating multi switch vlans using trunking right so what we have in this we have some concepts right so configuring vlan on a single switch it needs only a little effort right you simply configure each port to tell it the vlan number to which the port belongs right now with multiple switches you have to consider additional concepts about how to forward traffic between switches now when you are using vlans in networks that have multiple interconnected switches the switch need to use vlan trunking on the links between the switches right now what is vlan trunking okay now vlan trunking does what it causes the switches to use a process which is called vlan tagging yes so by which the sending switch adds another header 
to the frame before sending it over the trunk. Now the this extra trunking header includes VLAN ID, right? So that the sending switch can associate the frame with a particular VLAN ID and the receiving switch can know in what VLAN each frame belongs. Yes. So the below one is VLAN 20, the above one is VLAN 10, right? So if switch one is from VLAN 10, this device is sending some data to switch to VLAN 20. Right? So what will happen? We have to add a header. Right? And that header will be having VLAN ID. That the VLAN ID will be like VLAN 20 we have to go. Right? So in VLAN 20, the, uh, the uh, data needs to be sent, right? Right. So VLAN tagging, it separates the network into multiple segments, right? Each segment is assigned a unique identifier tag and VLAN tags are used to control network access and traffic, right? So VLAN trunking, it creates one link between the switches that support as many VLANs as you need. As a VLAN trunk, the switches treat the link as if it were a part of the VLAN, right? At the same time, the trunk keeps the VLAN traffic separate. So frames in VLAN 10, like uh, the image that we saw, frames in VLAN 10, would not go to devices in VLAN 20 and vice versa because each frame is identified by VLAN number as it crosses the trunk. Right? So, the use of trunking, it allows the switches to forward frames from multiple VLANs over a single physical connection by adding a small header to the Ethernet frame. Now, this image shows this PC11 sending a broadcast frame on interface FA0 slash 1, right? Fast Ethernet 1, right? In the step 1, right? Now, what happens, right? To flood the frame, switch switch 1, right? It needs to forward the broadcast frame to switch 2, right? And switch 1 needs to let switch 2 know that the frame is a part of VLAN 10. So that after the frame is received, switch 2 will flood the frame only into VLAN 10 and not into VLAN 20. Right? So as you can see here in uh, step number 2, before sending the frame, switch 1 adds a VLAN header to the original Ethernet frame. With the VLAN header saying uh, VLAN 10 here, right? as we can see in the image. Now when switch 2 receives this frame, right? it understands that the frame is in VLAN 10. So switch to then removes the VLAN header and it forwards the original frame out of its interface in VLAN 10. Right? Right? Now for another example, uh, consider this case, this 21. Right? PC21 sends a broadcast. Now switch 1 sends broadcast out of port number 4. Right? Because that port is in VLAN 20. That's why. Right? And it sends it out of the gigabit interface as well. Right? Because it is a trunk, meaning that it supports multiple different VLANs. So switch 1 will add a trunking header to the frame 
it will list a VLAN ID of 20 and switch 2 will strip off the trunking header after determining the fr that the frame is the part of VLAN 20. So switch 2 knows to forward the frame out only of the ports 3 and 4 because they are in VLAN 20 and not to port 1 and 2 right because they are in VLAN 10 right so that's how the data is sent now there is the standard 802.1q and ISL right now let's discuss about the 801 like Cisco has supported two different trunking protocol over the years right the first one is ISL ISL stands for inter switch link right and it has also supported the IEEE's 802.1q right so Cisco created ISL years before 802.1q in part because IEEE had not yet defined a VLAN trunking standard. Today 802.1q has become more popular trunking protocol with Cisco not even bothering to support ISL and many of it uh, its switch mode models today. Right. While both ISL and 802.1q tag each frame with the VLAN ID, the details differ. 802.1q which we have it adds a 4 byte header for specifying the VLAN details right so as for the fields in 802.1q header only the 12 bit VLAN ID field is inside right and vlan id field only matters right this one this 12 bits field only this thing matters right this 12 bit field supports a theoretical maximum of uh, 2 raised to the power 12 vlans that means 4096 vlans but in practice it supports maximum of 40 9.4 VLANs. So before 802.1Q uh, and ISL, they use 12 bits uh, to tag the VLAN ID with two reserved values, right? So, so Cisco switches, they break the range of VLAN IDs from 1 to 4.0.9.4, right? In two ranges, right? Now the normal range and the extended range. All switches they can they use the normal range they use VLANs with values from 1 to 1005 right only some switches they can ex use extended range right and VLAN IDs from 1006 till 4094 right now the rules for which the switches can use extended range the VLANs they depend on the configuration of VLAN trunking protocol VTP right so we'll discuss about VLAN trunking protocol as well now 802.1q it also defines one special VLAN ID right on each trunk as the native VLAN right so by definition 802.1q simply does not add an 802.1q uh, header into the frames in the native VLAN. When the switch on the other side of the trunk receives a frame that does not have uh, 802.1q header, the receiving switch know, knows that the frame is the part of native VLAN. Because of this behavior both switches they must agree on which VLAN is the native VLAN right and when we are talking about this native VLAN so 
so the native vlan it provides some interesting functions right uh, mainly to support connections to devices that do not understand trunking right now for example let's say cisco switch could be uh, cable to a switch that does not understand 802.1q trunking right so cisco switch could send frames in the native vlan meaning that the frame has no trunking header so that the other switch would understand the frame and the native vlan concept it gives switches the capability of at least passing traffic in one vlan right which can allow some basic functions like reachability to telnet into a switch right now If I talk about ISL, right? This 802.1Q is adding four byte header. ISL adds 26 bytes of header and four byte of trailer or footer in the packet. That much heavy it is, right? So that is what that is your ISL which is created for Cisco devices only by Cisco Perfect now if we can see uh, How to forward data between VLANs? So if you create a campus local area network that contains many VLANs You typically still need all the devices to be able to send data to all the other devices right so don't you think we need a router like uh, the router if i remove the router would these devices be able to communicate with these servers if i remove the router if this router is removed router or router it is removed then will I be able to communicate like these users will they be able to communicate with the servers? No Now what is the need of router correct we need router to communicate between different VLANs so LAN switches <clears throat> That forward data based on layer 2 logic Right often go by the name layer 2 switch, right? so they perform like uh, they do what they look at the destination ethernet mac address right and forward the ethernet uh, frame to other interfaces right so all those concepts are defined by layer 2 protocols right that's why it's named layer 2 switch now layer 2 switches they perform their logic per vlan right so what is the meaning of per vlan let me tell you that let's understand this visually yes perfect now in this these two pcs are sitting in vlan 10 right and these two pcs are sitting in vlan 20 right and the subnet is also 10 here in vlan 10 the subnet is 20 in vlan 20 right now this time the switch is broken into two halves right it's the uh, the picture that we used uh, uh, like we saw right but now the switch is broken into two parts two halves right to emphasize the point that layer 2 switches will not forward data between vlans right so when these devices they are configured with some ports in vlan 10 and other other ports in vlan 20 the switch acts like two separate switches in which it will forward traffic right so one goal of vlan is to separate traffic in one vlan from another preventing frames in one vlan from leaking over to other vlans 
right so for example let's say when dino in vlan 10 sends any ethernet frame right if switch one is a layer two switch switch will not forward the frame to pcs on the right in vlan 20 yes or no so just consider this this is a switch and this is a switch right two devices are connected to this switch and two devices are connected to this switch so if this pc is well, let's say pc1 is sending some data so will that data reach here so that's why his routing is required when we are talking about routers routing backups between vlans with the router so when we are including vlans in a campus lan design the devices in the vlan needs to be in the same subnet right following the same design logic right the devices in different vlans needs to be in different subnets to forward packets between vlans the network must use a device that acts as a router right so you can use an actual router as well as some other switches that can perform some functions like a router right and these switches that also perform layer 3 routing functions they go by the name layer 3 switch or multi-layer switch now first let's see how the data is transferred using uh, like layer two switches right so let me paste another picture so that we can understand how it is transferred vlan 10 and vlan 20 so it shows a router right that can route packets between subnets 10 and 20 right now this figure is also showing the same layer 2 switch right with the same perspective of switch being split into two different parts with two different vlans and with the same pcs in the same VLANs and subnets. Now, router 1, this R1, has one LAN physical interface connected to the switch and assigned to VLAN 10. And second physical interface connected to the, uh, to the switch and assigned to VLAN 20. Right? So, with one interface connected to each subnet, the layer 2 switch can keep doing its job forwarding frames inside a vlan while the router can do its job routing ip packets between the subnets right so in this we can see the packets are being sent right so packets are being routed from fred who sits in one vlan and subnet to betty who sits in other vlan and subnet Right now, layer two switch it forwards two different layer two Ethernet frames. One in VLAN 10 from Fred to router one's F00 interface, right? And other in VLAN 20 from router one's F0 slash one interface to Betty, right? So from a layer 3 perspective, friend, Fred sends the IP packets to its default router and router routes the packet to another interface into another subnet where Betty resides. Now, the design in this box, but there are diff several different solutions for routing packets between VLANs, right? So now you got to know what is the need of routing right first is isolation interdepartmental communication guest access right so all these things now 
next thing is VLAN trunking protocol. So there is a protocol and it is a Cisco based protocol, right? Which is VLAN trunking protocol VTP. Right now, when we are talking about VTP, right? So it is a Cisco's proprietary tool on Cisco switches that ad advertises each VLAN configured in one switch so that all the other switches in the campus learn about the VLAN. Many enterprises, they choose to disable VTP, right? So you can easily disable VTP so that it has no impact on your switches in the lab, right? And nothing happens, right? Now, when we are talking about VTP, what exactly it is, what it does. So to carry a traffic from of a VLAN, it must be configured on the switch, right? So suppose, let's say if the user wants to send a frame from a source to the destination and the shortest path between them contains thousand switches. So to process a frame of any VLAN, VLANs should be configured first. So you have to configure the same VLANs on all the thousand switches manually. Now it will not be possible for the administrator to do that. Then comes your VTP for the rescue, right? So VTP allows you to add, delete and rename VLANs which is then propagated to other switches in the VTP domain. And VTP advertisements can be sent over 802.1Q trunks or ISL trunks. Perfect. Now, there are some requirements for the VTP, right? So, if you want VTP to communicate VLAN information between switches, right? Now, the first thing is VTP version so the vtp version should be same on the switches user wants to configure right now vtp domain right so the domain name of the vtp should be same if the domain name is different then for some uh, switches uh, the like let's say i want to rename the name uh, rename any vlans right so the information will be given to only the switches whose domain name I have written, right? So the domain name should be same on all the switches, right? Now one of the switches must be, one of the switches must be a server. Right. And then authentication should match if it is applied. So if you have applied authentication, it should match. Right. Now as it is written, there are three modes, right? Server mode, client mode, transparent mode. Now, these three modes, server modes are like the switches that are set to this mode by default, right? And it allows you to create, add and delete VLANs, right? Now, the changes you want to make should be done in this mode any changes that are done in this mode will be ad advertised to all the switches that are in the same vtp domain right in this mode the configurations are saved in nvram right where the configurations are saved in nvram Perfect.
then client mode what is client mode in client mode the switches they receive the updates and can also forward updates to other switches right so the updates received here are not saved in nvram all the configurations will be deleted if the switch is reset or reloaded that means the switches they will only uh, learn and pass the vtp summary advertisements to the other switches right then transparent mode right what is transparent mode this mode only forwards the vtp summary advertisements through trunk link right so the transparent mode switches can make their own local database which keep secret from other switches and the whole purpose of transparent mode is to forward the vtp summary advertisements but not to take part in vlan assignments now the next thing data and voice vlan concepts right so this topic is strange at least in the context of access links and trunk links so in the world of ip telephony yeah the transparent mode you're talking about okay so in transport transparent mode what i'm doing uh, i'm not telling whole information right now in client mode what we are doing we are sending the information to all the other switches right we are advertising the information whatever i have received but in transparent mode only through trunk link i am sending the data so trunk link means the link through which i am connected to the interface uh, through which uh, i am connected to the router so only through that link i am sending the data then i don't know where it will go right that is transparent now as i said like in the world of ip telephony telephones they use ethernet ports to connect to an ethernet network so they can uh, use ip to send and receive voice traffic uh, sent through ip packets now to make that work the switches ethernet port acts like an access port but at the same time the port acts like a trunk in some ways right now when we are talking about the data and voice vlan concepts so before ip telephony a pc could sit on the same desk as a phone the phone happened to use utp cabling now with that phone connected to some voice device voice switch we we used to call it or a pbx we used to call it call it private branch exchange right the pc of course connected using an unshielded twisted PTP cable LAN switch and that's set in the wiring closet right sometimes in same wiring closet as the voice switch right now the term that I have given you IP telephony so the term IP telephony it refers to the branch of networking in which telephones use IP packets to send and receive voice as represented by the bits in the data portion of the IP packet. So the phones they connect to the network like uh, most end user devices using either Ethernet or Wi-Fi and these new IP phones they did not connect through cable directly to a voice switch instead connecting to a ip network using an ethernet cable and an ethernet port built into the phone so the phones then communicated over the ip network with software that replaced the call setup and other functions of the pbx right so the migrations from the already install telephone cabling to these new ip phones that needed utp cables that supported ethernet caused some problems in some offices 
right so what are the problems what problems happen like the older non ip phones they use the category of utp cabling that often did not support 100 mbps or 1000 mbps ethernet most offices had a single utp cable running from the wiring closet to each desk but now two devices the pc and the new ip phone right both needed a cable from uh, the des desktop to the wiring closet now installing a new cable to every desk it will be expensive plus you would need more switchboard so to solve all these problems right what they did cisco they embedded three port switches into each phone right so ip telephones have included a small lan switch on the underside of the phone and since the earliest ip telephone products shows the basic cabling the wiring closet cable connecting to one physical port on the embedded switch the pc connecting with a short patch cable to the other physical port the phone's internal cpu connecting to internal switch port everything was done right the sites when we are talking about the ip telephony so the sites that use ip telephony right uh, like all the companies today right so now have two devices off each access port right so in addition cisco best practices for ip telephony design tells us to put the phones in one vlan and the pc in a different vlan to make that happen the switch port acts a little like access link for the pc traffic to make and a little like trunk for the phone's traffic right so the configuration defines two VLANs on that port if you can see this picture the data VLAN same idea and configuration as the access VLAN on the access port but defined as VLAN on that link for forwarding the traffic for the device connected to the phone on the desk right voice VLAN the vlan defined on the link for forwarding the phone's traffic so traffic in this vlan is typically tagged within 802.1q header now next thing this was about vlans right now next thing that we have to understand is Spanning tree protocol concepts. So, what is spanning tree protocol? What it does? How it works? Let me know. Right? Without some mechanism like spanning tree protocol or rapid spanning tree protocol, a LAN with redundant links. What are redundant links? What do you understand by the word redundant links? so when i'm saying redundant links so let's say you are going somewhere so you have multiple path to reach somewhere right that is redundant link two path so either to take first one or second one you will reach the same place right that is redundant link now when we are talking about stp right so a lan with redundant links will cause ethernet frames to loop for an infinite period of time with stp or rstp enabled some switches they block the ports so that these ports do not forward frames right stp and rstp intelligently choose which ports to block right now it has two with uh, two they, for blocking they have two goals in mind right all devices in the vlan can send frames to all the devices 
in other words stp or rstp does not block too many ports cutting off some parts of the lan from other parts right now next thing is frames have a short life and they do not loop around the network indefinitely right so these are the two things which are kept in mind when uh, stp was created and it is implemented right so stp and rstp they strike a balance allowing frames to be delivered to each device without causing the problems that occur when frames loop through the network over and over again right so as i told you uh, like there is a uh, like there is a characteristic of a switch right the characteristic is if switch does not know any location let's say this pc there is pc pc1 is connected to this switch and pc1 sends some data so pc1 says send this data to pc7 which does not exist and which is not connected to either of the switch in the whole network what switch one does let's say this is switch one so switch one broadcast the information so it broadcasted the information here the information reached in the switch two right then switch two also does not know where is pc7 so it also broadcasted the information then it went to switch three right switch three also sent the information and it go, broadcasted the information so it sent it to switch four right now keep eye on this switch 4 right now switch 4 also forwarded that information because switch 4 also does not know where pc7 is so it went to switch 5 right and from switch 5 also broadcasted that information so it went to switch 1 again right now when that data arrived right so who sent it pc1 right and whenever any data arrives inside when the data is coming into the switch right then switch reads the information and saves it in its table that table is known as cam table right content addressable memory where your mac address where your MAC address and port number is mapped with each other right now let's look at the cam table of this switch 4 right what happened switch 1 said like PC1 sent the data so switch 1 did what switch 1 wrote let's say the MAC address of PC1 is AAA right so switch 1 say PC1 is AAA and whenever I want to send the data to PC1 so I will send it through uh, let's say this is interface 2 and this is interface 1 right so I will the switch PC1 send the data from here so at interface 1 0 1 switch PC1 is there right then again when i said pc this switch one broadcasted the information it only didn't broadcast it here broadcasted means all the sites so it sent the information from here as well so the this information it broadcasted from here it went to this uh switch five right switch five sent it to switch four now PC, switch four will again change the table right that no it is not uh aaa is not on one but it is on second interface and it will keep on changing that it is on first interface second interface all the switches they are just forwarding the information to each other they are just uh, broadcasting the information to all the interfaces they are connected like this if i talk about this switch this switch is sending data to switch one as well switch three as well switch three is sending again the data to switch two also and switch four also 
right so the information is looping and this cam table of all these devices they are they keep on changing and switches will fail or crash right that is what happens when stp is not implemented right perfect so as i said stp it prevents looping frames by adding an additional check on each interface before a switch uses it to send or receive user traffic right now what is that check i'm talking about if the port is in stp or rstp forwarding state in that vlan use it as normal if it is in blocking state right however block all user traffic and do not send or receive user traffic on that interface in that vlan right so these stp rstp states do not change and the other information uh, you already know about switch interface so the interface state of connected not connected does not change right and the interfaces operational state as either uh, a access or trunk port does not change right yeah i'll tell you the whole difference between stp and rstp right first let's see how they work how this thing works and then uh, i'll let you know how what is the difference between both of them right the difference is the states so first we have to understand the working then only we'll be able to understand the states of uh, stp and rstp and that is the difference right so stp or rstp it prevents three common problems in ethernet lan right all three problems they occur as a side effect of one fact Without STP RSTP, some Ethernet frames would loop around the network for a long time, hours, days, or until the link fails, right? Just one looping frame causes one thing, which is called broadcast storm. So broadcast storm happen when any kind of Ethernet frames broadcast frames multicast frames or unknown destination unicast frames loop around a lan indefinitely right and broadcast storms can saturate all the links with copies of that one single frame crowding out good frames as well as significantly impacting end user device performance by making the pcs process too many broadcast frames now if you see this image right so it is showing a simple network in which bob sends a broadcast frame let's say this bob right at the the bottom one user right so bob he sends a broadcast frame right now these lines which are created the dashed lines right so they show how the switches forward the frame when stp or rstp does not exist right now the logic tells the switches to flood or broadcast out all interfaces in the same vlan except the interface in which the frame arrived right that means switch 3 forwards the bob's frame to switch 2 switch 2 forwards the frame to switch 1 and switch 1 forwards the frame back to switch 3 right and it goes on again and again so when broadcast storm happens like in this picture right so it keeps looping until something changes someone such shuts down an interface reloads the switch or does something else to uh, break the loop and also remember that same event happens in the opposite direction so when bob sends the original frame switch 3 also forwards a copy to switch 1 right switch 1 forwards it to switch 2 right 
and then switch two to switch three. Yes, right, and it causes much more subtle problem, which is called. Mac table Inst instability, right? Mac table instability means that the switches. MAC address tables keep changing because frames with same source MAC address or different ports arrive, right? So that is one thing, right? Now to understand this, right? Uh, what we can do? There is an I'll just pick up any switch right from in this situation, right? So when switch two sent some information, right? Like Bob is sending the data, right? So Bob sent the data to switch three, switch three forwarded to switch two, right? Now switch two sent that information to switch one. So switch one say, okay, Bob is sitting at interface GI01. That's great. So it will put it in the interface. Right? Now, when switch one sh sends that inform, uh, switch three sends that information to switch one, so it will say, okay, Bob is sitting at GI zero slash two interface, right? So it will always keep on changing and die. Right now, this is the problem, right? And how the need uh, was removed, right? Next, what spanning tree protocol does? So, what it does, it prevents loops by placing each switch port in either a forwarding state or a blocking state. Right, so interfaces in the forwarding state they act as normal forwarding and receiving frames. Right, the interfaces in blocking state they do not process any frames except STP RSTP messages. Now, interfaces that block do not forward user frames, do not learn MAC addresses of received frames, and do not process received user frames. Right now. In this uh, image, if you can see, it's written block. So when this Bob sends frame to switch three, right? Switch three forwards the frame only to switch one, right? But not zero to interface to switch two because this interface is in a blocking state. Now switch one floods the frame out of both, right? FA011 and GI01, right? So switch two, then switch two floods the frame, right? So what it does, it sends it out from here and here, right? And switch three physically receives the frame but it ignores the frame received from switch 2 because switch 3's interface GI02 is in blocking state right now it is only configured on our interface GI0 slash 2 because from here you can see that the frame is arriving. 
so as i said the last line physically switch 3 receives the frame but it ignores the frame received from switch 2 because switch 3's interface is in a blocking state now if you see here right in this image right the switches simply do not use the link between switch 2 and switch 3 for traffic in this vlan which is minor negative side effect of stp right so if either of the other two link fail stp or rstp converges so that switch 3 forwards instead of blocks on this interface right so there is a word which i said stp a term convergence now stp convergence it refers to the process by which switches they collectively realize that something has changed in the LAN topology and they determine whether they need to change which port blocks and which port forwards right now we should know that how this STP works. Right. Now, the STP algorithm, it creates a spanning tree of interfaces that forward frames. The tree structure of forwarding interfaces, it creates single path to and from Ethernet link. Just like you can trace a single path in a living growing tree from the base of the tree to the leaf. Right. Now the process used by STP, sometimes it is called spanning tree. algorithm right so spanning tree algorithm chooses the interface that should be placed into the forwarding state and for any interfaces not chosen to be in forwarding state stp or rstp places the interfaces in a blocking state in other words it simply picks which interfaces should forward and any interfaces left over go to a blocking stage right so stp uses three criteria to choose whether to put an interface in forwarding state or not first it elects a root switch right or root bridge Right here, bridge means we are referring to the switch only. Right, it's not the device bridge I'm using. I'm only using the switch. Yep, perfect. Now it elects a root switch and it puts all working interfaces on the root switch for uh, in forwarding stage, right? Now each non-root switch considers one of its ports to have the least administrative cost between itself and the root switch. The cost is called the switch's root cost, right? So STP RSTP places its port that is part of the least root cost path. Right? Many switches can attach to same Ethernet segment as well. But due to the fact that uh, links connect two devices, 
a link would have at most two switches with two switches on a link the switch with the lowest root cost as compared with other switches attached to the same link in place in forwarding state the switch is the designated switch and that interface which interface attached to that segment is called designated port right now it depends right so there are ways by which you elect there are uh, like steps by which you elect the root switch it's not that if someone if there is a vtp switch then only it will be elected as a root switch or right or root bridge Now, the STP bridge ID and hello BPDU, right? Now, what is that BPDU? Okay. Now, the spanning tree algorithm, it begins with an election of one switch to be the root switch, right? And to better understand this, election process you need to understand the stp messages which are sent be between the switches as well as the concept and format of identifier used to uniquely identify each switch right so stp bridge id right so if i write it here it's an 8 byte value unique to each switch the bridge id consists of 2 byte priority field and 6 byte system id right being based on a universal mac address in each switch right and using a burnt in mac address ensures that each switch's bridge id will be unique right so it defines some messages stp it defines messages called bpdu right so bpdu stands for bridge protocol data unit right also called configuration bpdus which switches used to exchange information with each other so the most common bpdu is called hello bpdu right it lists many detail including the sending switch uh, bid bridge id right by listing its own bridge id right switches can tell which switch sent hello bpdu so this is generally written like special frames for network topology exchange between switches vital for root bridge election path and path determination right so the information it has is root bridge id right then senders bridge id right then senders root cost right and 
then timer values on the root switch for the time being just keep the first three items root bridge id senders bridge id and senders root cost in mind right and these three sections work through the three steps and how stp chooses the interface to place into forwarding state now the text examines the three main steps in the stp process now here we have is electing the root switch right now switches the elector root switch based on the bid bridge id in the bpdu the root switch is the switch with the lowest numeric value for bridge id because the two part bridge id starts with the priority value essentially the switch with the lowest priority becomes the root so if any switch it has a priority of 4096 right and another switch has a priority of 8192 so the switch with 4096 wins regardless of what mac address was used to create bridge id for each switch right now if a tie occurs let's say there are two switches having same bridge id based on the priority por portion of the bridge id the switch with the lowest mac address portion of the bridge id is the root now no other tie breaker should be needed because switches they use one of their own universal mac addresses in the second part of their bridge id so if priority is tie the one switch uses mac address of let's say uh this is having aaa and this is having ddd as mac address so which one will win the one having aaa now why it is small because a is a means 10 so it is 10 plus 10 plus 10 30 right and this is d that means 13 right so it is 13 plus 13 plus 13 right which is 39 right so output of this is lower as compared to this so the switch one will become the root switch or root bridge right got the point if only if the root bridge or let's say uh, the priorities match right so whenever we start the switches like whenever there is no like spanning tree protocol is not set and everything so all the uh, all the switches right what they say all the switches say that i am the root bridge right now for now i am let's say uh, this switch has aaa as the mac address this is bbb and this is 999 right just assuming now all these switches what they do they will out of their all the ports they will start sending these bpdus saying that i am the root bridge i am the root bridge right now let's say the bridge id for this switch is uh, 2048 right 4096 and 1024 right these are the bridge ids so when switch one says switch one sends the broadcast the information that i am the root bridge bridge id 2048 now this information goes to 
switch 3. Now switch 3 was also sending that I am also the root bridge but when switch 3 gets the information from switch 1, right? So switch 3 compared its own bridge ID with the bridge ID of switch 1. It says the bridge ID of switch 1 is less than me, right? Now switch 3 will start broadcasting the same BPDU but for switch 1. So now switch 3 will say that switch 1 is the root bridge. Then switch 2 is also forwarding that information. So switch 2 also forwards that information to switch 3 and switch 1. Now switch 1 and switch 3 they checked the uh, the broadcast bridge ID of the switch right and then they told that the lowest one is switch 2 so now they all of them they are advertising for switch 2 that switch 2 is the root bridge or root switch right so STP RSTP elects a root switch in a manner not like political election right so all of them they start claiming to be root by sending hello BPDUs they list their root uh, BID if a switch hears a hello that lists a better or lower bridge ID that switch stops advertising itself and as root and starts forwarding the superior hello the hello sent by the better switch lists the better switch uh, bridge ID as the root. So it works like a political race in which a less popular candidate gives up and leaves the race throwing his support behind the more popular candidate. Right? And eventually everyone agrees which switch has the best or lowest bridge ID and everyone supports the elected switch which is where political uh, race analogy falls apart. Right. Then next thing is choosing each switch's root port. Right. Now the second part of STP process occurs when each non-root switch chooses its one and only root port. Right, and root uh, a switch's root port is its interface through which it has least cost to reach the non root or, or the root switch, the lead, least root cost. Right now, the idea of switch's cost to reach the root switch can be easily seen from humans. Just look at this uh, diagram that shows the root switch. Right now list the cost associated with each switch port and it identifies the non-root switch in question right so switches use a different process than looking at the diagram of course right but using a diagram can make it easier to understand right so these three switches shown in the figure switch one has already won the election as root right switch one is the root right and now we have to consider the cost from switch three's perspective right so switch three has possible two possible physical path right to reach the switch one right the root switch so the direct path is from the left this one this is the direct path right and indirect path to the right right through this through the switch 2 and then to the root switch right so the cost is the sum of cost of all the switch ports the frame would exit
right if it flowed over the path so the calculation ignores the inbounds so as you can see the cost over direct path out of switch 3 port the total cost is 5 right and the other path has a total cost of 8 so switch 3 will pick this g0 gi01 as root port because it is the port that is part of the least cost path to send frames to the root switch right now switches come to same conclusion but using a different process instead they add their local interface stp cost to the root cost listed in each received hello bpdu right so the stp like uh, the stp port cost is an integer value assigned to each interface per vlan for the purpose of providing an objective measurement which allows stp to choose their uh, which interfaces to add to to the stp topology now the switches also look at their neighbors root cost right as announced in bpdu right so right now focus on this process right root switch sends hellos with a listed root cost of zero so the idea is that the root cost to reach itself is zero right so it never went out for finding the root switch so it says root cost is zero switch 3 takes the received cost zero right and then from the hello which is sent by the switch one and it adds the interface cost of the interface on which uh, that hello was received right so the cost of the interface is five so zero plus five five right then switch three calculates the cost to reach the root switch out of the port g01 and that is five right on the right side Switch 2 has realized its best cost to reach the root, right? And the cost is 4, right? From this GI02 port. So for, for switch 2, the cost is 4. Yes. Now switch 3's STP port cost on port 02 is 4, right? So switch 3 determines a total cost to reach root out of its gi02 port is 4 4 from for itself and 4 for the interface of switch 2 so 4 plus 4 8 right so as a result which is shown here switch 3 chooses gi01 as its root port because the cost to reach the root switch through that port is lower than the other alternative right similarly like that switch 2 chooses gi02 uh, interface as its root port with a cost of 4 right so each switch places its root port into forwarding state okay so when these situations happen like uh, on both of the interfaces the cost is same right so what they do there are three tie breakers to use in this case right if a tie occurs the switch applies three tie breakers right first one is choose based on the lowest neighbor bridge id right second choose 
based on the lowest neighbor port priority right or choose based on the lowest neighbor internal port number right right now designated port on each lan segment is the switch port that advertises the lowest cost hello on a lan segment so when a non root switch forwards a hello message the non root switch sets the root cost field in the hello to that uh, switch's cost to reach the root right so the switch with the lower cost to reach the root among all switches connected to the segments become the designated port on that segment in this image in bold text the parts of the hello messages from both switch 2 and switch 3 that determine the choice of designated port on this on that segment right it, it is showing that right so both switch 2 and switch 3 list their respective cost to reach the root switch right on switch 2 the cost is 4 on switch 3 cost is 5 so switch 2 is listing the lower cost so switch 2's gi01 port is the designated port on lan segment and all the uh, designated ports are placed in forwarding state so in this case switch 2's 0 gi01 interface will be in forwarding state right so now in this who is in forwarding state let's first look at switch one so switch ones both of the interfaces are in forwarding stage right why because the interface on the root switch right and it becomes the designated port on that link right because the root cost is zero now switch 2 right in switch 2 which one will be the root port of the switch this was the root port right interface 2 of switch 2 right that's why it will be in forwarding state then the switch 2's 0 1 will be in forwarding state because it is the designated port on the LAN segment the segment between switch 2 and switch 3 right then in switch 3, the 0 1, 0 1 interface will be in forwarding because it is the root port of switch 3. And this 0 2 will be in blocking state. Right? Why it will be in blocking state? Because it is not the root port and it is also not the designated port. right so that's how the stp is done right it works right so the switch 3's second interface will not accept any data from switch 2 right it will get the data but it will not accept it right that is how on the basis of designate uh, like on the basis of designated ports and root ports you work with stp right now 
रैपिड एस okay the tie part great now as i told if the tie happens right so if the tie happens here right and switch 3 let's say or let's go back to the image if the tie happens here right so it will choose on the basis of lowest neighbor bridge id right either on this interface or in this interface whose bridge id is lowest who which neighbors either switch two's uh, bridge id is lowest or switch one's bridge id is lowest right and the port priority so the priority number which we talked about like the priority number for switch two is 4096 and if it is for 10244 for switch one so so this gi01 will be chosen right and the internal port number right which port number it is using so let's say uh, switch one has port number 02 and there is port number 01 right so on the basis of these three whichever will be lowest right that will be chosen right so switch three will choose only the one which has lowest all three right bridge bridge id is lowest either or port priority is lowest or internal port number is lowest right on the basis of that it will choose right so it will check its neighbors now when the tie occurs now as we were talking about the rstp right so the original stp it worked well and given the assumptions about network and networking devices in that era but as with many uh, computing or networking standard as time passes the hardware and software capabilities improve so new protocols emerge to take advantage of new capabilities right so for stp one of the most significant improvement over time has been the introduction of rstp rapid spanning tree protocol right so anyone who knows any difference how it is different from uh, the original stp now let's compare when we are talking about stp and rstp right so rstp also works just like stp in several ways right rstp and stp they both elect the root switch using same rules right then they also select their root ports with the same rules right and they both elect designated ports on each lan segment with the same rules right and they will also put each port in forwarding or blocking state state right now rstp calls the blocking state as the discarding state right so as i said rstp works so much like stp that they can both be used in the same network rstp and stp switches can be deployed in the same network with rstp features working in switches that support it and traditional stp features working in the switches that support only stp now with all these similarities you might be wondering why like this rstp was created in the first place so the overriding season uh, the override uh, like is thing is convergence we talked about right so the reason is convergence stp takes long time to converge right 50 seconds with the default settings uh when all the wait times must be followed right rstp it improves the network convergence when topology changes occur usually uh converging within few seconds or in slow conditions uh in about 10 seconds right so rstp changes 
and adds to STP in ways that avoid waiting for STP timers, resulting in quick transitions from forwarding to blocking state or discarding state and vice versa. Right. So RSTP compared to STP defines more cases in which switch can avoid waiting for a timer to expi expire. Right. Then uh, RSTP, one more thing it does, it adds a mechanism by which switch can replace its root port without any waiting to reach a forwarding state right and there is one more thing it can replace designated port also right and it lowers the waiting time for cases in which rstp must wait for a timer right now think of it let's say there is a failure case in which a link remains up but for some reason a non-root switch stops hearing the hello BPD use it had been hearing in the past then yep what will happen so STP requires a switch to wait for some seconds right uh, which STP defines based on 10 times the hello timer or 20 seconds by default right RSTP does what it shortens this timer and it defines max age as three times to the hello timer right so rstp can send messages to the neighboring switch to inquire whether a problem has occurred rather than wait for the timers and the best way to get a sense for these mechanisms is to see how, how the rstp alternate port and backup port both work right so it uses a term right and that term is known as alternate port right which is written over here as well alternate port so it refers to switches other ports that could be used as a root port so if the root port ever fails right now there is backup port concept as well so it provides a backup port on the local switch for a designated port right and both are instructive about how rstp works right now as i said we have designated root port right so what is root port port that begins a non-root switches best path to the root right then there is alternate port port that replaces the root port when the root port fails designated port switch port designated to forward onto a collision domain right and then there is backup port port that replaces the designated port when a designated port fails and then there is one more thing which is called disabled port right now what is disabled port port that is administratively disabled right so that is how it is uh, stp and rstp are different right there are other few other ways as well like with stp the root switch it creates a hello with all the other switches updating and forwarding the hello with rstp each switch independently generate its own hellos right and rstp allows for queries between neighbors rather than waiting on timers to expire so as a means to avoid waiting to learn information and these types of protocol changes the rstp based switches isolate what has changed in the network and react react quickly to choose a net rstp topology right so if we compare stp and rstp right on the basis of standards right so we can see it here right so eight zero two dot one w was actually an amendment to the eight zero two dot one d protocol or standard the i triple e the first published eight zero two dot one d which is used by stp in nineteen ninety and a new in 1998 
so after the 1998 version of 802.1d the ieee published the 802.1w amendment in 2001 which first standardized the rstp over the years other meaningful changes happen in the standards as well right although those changes probably do not impact most uh, networkers thinking when it comes to working with stp or rst but but to to be complete i triple e replaced stp with rstp in the revised 802.1d standard in 2004 and in another move in 2011 i triple e they moved all the rstp details into 802.1q standard right so when you are when you are reading about rstp you will see documents books videos and uh, like that uh, they refer to rstp and include various references to these 802.1w 1d and 1q and they might all be correct based on the timing and context right at the same time many people refer to rstp as 802.1w because that was the first ieee document to define it right however for the purpose of all the things according to the ccna right you will uh, always use rstp right like if you are preparing for ccna you will go for exam so you won't see 802.1w right but you will see rstp now what are the other things in stp only the road bridge sends bpdus which are then relayed by other switches in rstp all bridges all switches they can forward bpdus then stp defines three primary port roles root port designated port block port right in rstp root port designated port alternate port backup port right now the port states which is very important right in stp it is forwarding learning listening blocking and disabled right rstp forwarding learning discarding right so time will be saved right stp does not categorize link types rstp distinguishes between two link types shared link point to point link and stp is known for a uh, slower network con conversions right but rstp is known for its significantly faster network convergence compared to stp right so these are the things in rstp right now as we were discussing about port role or alternate uh, port right so with stp each non root switch places one port in stp root port role right we know that so rstp it also follows the same convention with the same exact rules for choosing the uh, root port rstp then takes another step beyond stp naming other possible root ports identifying them as alternate port right so to be in an alternate port both the root port and the alternate port must receive hello that identify the same root switch right so here we can see the switch 1 is the root switch 3 will receive hello bpdus on two ports right two interfaces GI02 and GI01 Now both hellos they list switch 1's bridge id as the root right so whichever port is not the root port meets the criteria to be an alternate port so switch 3 picks GI01 at as its root port so GI02 will be an alternate port right so it works like the second best option for the root port right and the alternate port can take over for the former root port right often very rapidly without requiring a wait in other interim 
are stp states for instance when root port fails or when hello stops arriving on the original root port the switch changes the former root port's role and state so the role from the root port to a disable port will be done and the state from forwarding to discarding or blocking state will be done right then without waiting for any timers the switch changes the rules and state for alternate port so its rules uh, this alternate port will be changed to root port with a forwarding state as well 